the Raising Kilim podcast. My name is Marsh Naidu. For those of you who are new to us, I'm a physical therapist by training as well as mom to Kilim, my nine-year-old munchkin with cerebral palsy. I blog at RaisingKilim.org as well as host this podcast where we curate resources for parents that are raising children with disabilities. In today's episode, episode number 46, I chat with Alex Farrell. And guys, if you are early childhood educators, this is the podcast episode for you. Alex Farrell is a marketing and communication specialist at Signal Centers in Chattanooga, Tennessee, as well as co-host of the podcast, Mean Into You. This episode is brought to you by Move Up Physical Therapy. And without further ado, here is Alex. But right off the bat, um, I would love to ask the question, how did you come to work at Signal Centers? And can you tell the listeners out there a little bit about the uh, history and what Signal Centers is all about? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting story. Um, I started, uh, frankly, I started at Signal Centers simply because I needed a job. Um, and I actually started there at um, in the accounting department. So something entirely different than what I'm doing now was placed there through a temp agency. And then, um, th- over time being in that department, I kind of started noticing in their marketing department, which was kind of was adjacent to where we were, um, that there were some opportunities for growth. And so I offered my services to be able to fill in a day here and there. And then that grew and grew and grew until, I was kind of stopped doing the accounting stuff and was was over into uh, the marketing world. And then um, one thing that I really love about Signal Centers is the executive staff here are very good at leverage. When they recognize that someone has a certain skill set, they will do what they need to do and reorder things to make sure that person is really leveraging what they're good at. So over time, I proved that I was um, was providing a lot of value in this area. And um, so they kind of gave me more more freedom and more responsibility. And so now, currently, my, my position within Signal Centers, I'm the marketing and communication specialist for um, a statewide program that's funded through the Department of Human Services called Child Care Wages Tennessee. Um, and this is where the, the podcast actually comes from. Um, we're a program that gives um, education-based salary supplements to early childhood educators because um, we're trying to help reduce kind of turnover and um, address um, a lack of post-secondary education in early childhood, um, the early childhood field. So um, that's what I've been doing for the last year and a half, two years almost. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but I guess the last year has kind of been (laughs) a blur for most people. But so that's kind of my story with my background with Signal Centers. As far as Signal Centers as an organization goes, um, it's pretty interesting because we were talking in a a, a prep call earlier a few days ago about your how why you started raising Kellen and how you were, you know, you have a a, was a son, correct, with cerebral palsy. and how you wanted to start this podcast as a community for families who are have a similar experience um, of having a family member with a developmental disability. That's exactly how Signal Center started. So in 1957, before, obviously this is uh, 30 years before the, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, it was actually the uh, responsibility of parents Uh, or at that time, uh, parents to advocate for services for their family members um, that had disabilities. So Signal Center started in 1957 with nine families, and at that time it was families that had kids with cerebral palsy. Um, And it was nine nine families, nine kids in a classroom learning from one another. And then as kind of the research about um, childhood development has increased, our knowledge of um, developmental disabilities has increased, over time that model has changed. Um, and so now where we stand today, we have, um, a bunch of different services related to early childhood education and disabilities, um, as well. Um, but we, we implement what's called an inclusion model. So all of our, um, all of our childcare classes, um, have both children with disabilities and children without kind of learning from one another, um, 
and it's really it's really inspiring to see because you can see i mean as we know children are naturally curious anyways but to see them really encounter their peers that have such a vastly different life experience from them you can see all of these neurons just firing and and the growth happening you know right before your eyes so it's it's really cool to see i would like to touch on um, your recent digital accessibility summit can you speak a little bit about that and what was the motivation to uh, create the platform of the summit alex sure um so one of our programs in 1978 uh, we started a program called assistive technology services um, and it was basically you know, we do a lot of stuff but it's kind of the elevator speech of that is uh, that program is if um, you're an individual with a disability wide-ranging disability it could be vision loss it could be something a bit more medically fragile it depends uh, but we we can serve a whole host of of disabilities um, but if you are say you're at a, a certain part of your development and you want to be somewhere different uh, we can help um, refer you to train you on different technologies to help you reach the milestones that you want to reach um, and in many cases we can actually develop um, low cost, um, alternatives to, to, um, to different technologies that otherwise would be out of reach for people. So, um, it's really cool to see the, the workshop that we have over at assistive technology center. It's just, there's stuff lying around everywhere. And it's, it's really cool to see our engineers kind of, uh, meeting the needs of people very specifically, but creating these little devices that are transfer the you know, things that you and I might take for granted, but um, are totally transforming lives of the people that they're giving these devices to. So assistive technology um, trains people on technology, technological devices, refers people to different technologies that may suit their needs. But a huge part of what we do is um, we have a vision services, comprehensive vision services, and um, that's funded through the largely by the Ophthalmological Foundation in Chattanooga. And um, this is everything from teaching people how to use the accessibility features on their iPhone, um, how we've got a what's called a JAWS instructor, uh, JAWS being uh, job access with speech. And um, it's really cool. There's a classroom in our accessibility uh, or assistive technology center that is just eight computers in a dark classroom with no monitors and our our trainer will our instructor will come in and teach people how to surf the internet without using i mean obviously if they have a visual impairment of some sort or have no vision whatsoever they don't need a computer monitor so they do they'll surf, surf the internet um completely using vocalization and the, these programs computer programs um to navigate through different websites uh, which is kind of the foundation of why something like digital accessibility is really important, which we will touch on in a second, I'm sure. Um, but with yeah, that pro, sorry, I go ahead. I won't lie. I mean, with your guys' website, that was something that uh, immediately struck me was this of technology center. I mean, that was phenomenal. I mean, you're describing JAWS. Uh, so I have not had experience with this, and I'm sure most of our listeners have not. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you just go a little bit in depth as to what actually that is, please, Alex? Sure, absolutely. So um, when you have a website, um, and forgive me, I'm not a web developer, so this, this is going to be, uh, I may not know exactly all the, the, all the exact technological jargon, but um, when you have a website, there's what's called the front end and there's the back end. The front end is the website that we as the consumer experience. So when you go on the website, type into Google, you're interacting with the front end of a website. In order for that website to exist, it has to be developed on the back end. So the back end is all the HTML code, uh, the all the web, you know, the code that the web developers write to build the website. Jaw, what Jaws do does is it reads the code that's behind the scenes, kind of behind the curtain. And depending on how you write that code is dependent on how um, successful Jaws is at maneuvering through that website. And there are, when it comes to um, accessibility, there are best practices for developing and ordering that code or that website to make sure that JAWS, which it literally kind of tabs through menus, um, tabs through different elements of your website and reads it aloud to you, um, that it 
it is tabbing through in the correct order that it's actually being presented. So for your, so good. For, your uh, for the individual accessing the uh, information through JAWS, is it going to be something that's verbally spoken out that the person interprets or how does right. that? Right. So another, another way uh, to, it's a screen reader. Um, so if you're not familiar with JAWS, most people, many people, especially in, um, that are familiar with the disability space are familiar with screen readers. So uh, JAWS is a, is a kind of screen reader. Um, and so, yeah, when you, when you type in a URL um, or a website into the internet, um, JAWS will then tab down to literally top left. Again, if it's designed correctly, top left and read the first thing that's there. And it might say home page. And then you can hit the tab button. It'll go over to um, take Signal Center's website, for instance, programs, and then the about page. And it will kind of systematically tab through each one. And so the user, if they are looking for something specifically, have to actually manually tab through um, to access every part of that website. Um, and so what, what happens too often when accessibility is not taken into consideration when developing a website is you may have a screen reader read the, the top left menu and then jump down to the bottom of the page and then jump back up to a different part of the page and then jump all over the page all over the place and there's no organization of information which makes it really hard to interact impossible really to interact and have an idea of what's happening on that web page if that makes sense i'm sure that they um uh, disability specific technologies as well that's going to be really going in depth into the field but what would be your um, argument for universal design as far as uh, digital accessibility is concerned for the lay person sure i mean i think there's two two things to consider there's an ethical reason and then there's actually a business reason um, a, a fiscal incentive for a financial incentive for doing this. Um, the ethical reason being, um, there's some crazy statistic, I don't have the stat on the top of my head, but um, the amount of people that currently have a disability in the world is like- One billion. Yeah, one billion people. Um, so what, are we supposed to develop products that only taken, that are just going to willingly leave out one billion people and say no no you're not allowed you're, it's it's okay i'm not going to put in the extra time the extra work the extra effort to understand so that you can equally access this thing that everyone else gets to access so for me there's an ethical uh incentive that if we are being good stewards of of our work and our craft um that we should be developing with everyone in mind so that everyone has equal access to to the kinds of things that we want to put out into the world whatever that might be um, the other part of that is it was interesting so last year's accessibility summit um, we had a, a gentleman on named daniel ryan he is a web developer and a very good one um, and he worked he did some work with the obama campaign and uh, has worked with different public organizing uh, uh, organizations really to do uh, kind of web development for them and he, he mentioned something that was um, really interesting that the he read an article that I think the stat was if you are what he called baking in accessibility so if you're thinking about accessibility on the front end of when you're doing projects or developing things instead of um, having that being an afterthought uh, or something that you're reacting to after the fact. If you bake it in, it usually costs somewhere, you know, to to bring in resources, to bring bring everyone to the same ta table, you know, coworkers who might be able to uh, think about accessibility on the front end of a project. Usually, that costs about a thousand dollars to do that, whether it's labor, whatever it is. Um, if you have a complaint. In other words, if you don't consider that, you push your product out there and then there's some sort of complaint and you have to come back and redo everything, $10,000. And then if it comes back to you in the form of a lawsuit, $100,000 per instance. So there's a financial incentive for whether it's businesses or individuals to just be thinking about these kinds of things, whatever they produce, whatever they create, 
as they're developing websites to make sure that it's universally accessible for everyone. Because if they don't, the, the strictly the financial, um, um, the financial penalty could be upwards of a hundred thousand dollars, and that's per instance. Um, so it's best practices, uh, best practice to consider all of these things on the front end as you as you're in the process of creating things. Um, I think you make a solid uh, example there of the, the, the financial motivation of why companies need to be uh, thinking along those lines. Mm -hmm. but Alex, I, I want to, before time runs out, I really want to talk about your podcast. Early childhood educators have such a, a vital role in nurturing all children. However, self-care like so many of us is something that's put on the back burner. Sure. Was that perhaps some of the motivation for getting the podcast going? What fed the need for the podcast? Sure. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, so it started with my program with Child Care Wages Tennessee. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, we offer education based salary supplements. So we're trying to just straightforward. We're trying to make sure that educators can get paid more so that if we pay educators more, they're more likely to stay in the field, which has a direct benefit to the kids that they're serving. Um, and wages do, is, is phenomenal and is doing a great job at addressing financial stresses in the lives of educators because it's a difficult job. It's an impossibly difficult job um, and it takes a lot out of you. Um, and of course, financial strain is one layer of, of the complexity of that job. But what I was noticing is that it was totally possible for educators that we serve to receive a check from us, a direct deposit from us, get more money in their bank account, thereby you know helping to alleviate some of that financial stress, but still walking into the classroom with their head down, their shoulders slumped, with waning passions, um, lack of direction, um, and so for me, I, I really wanted to, the, the motivation was twofold. I really wanted to come behind the supplements, the, the financial supplements that we're issuing to educators with another layer of support and say, Hey, we want to provide something for you that is going to see you as a human being perhaps first and an educator second. Um, because if we're speaking to the human being first, it's the human being that shows up and is the educator. And so if we, if we're only trying to, if our mission is to serve educators, we need to serve them wholeheartedly, uh, a create a wide, um, web of support. And so the, the way that we did that is wanting to have weekly conversations with mindfulness experts, with health professionals, with, um, CEOs with, I mean, it's a, a pretty wide ranging, group of guests that we've been able to, to, to get on the show, but just talking about things like mindset, um, uh, mindfulness practices, strategies that you can implement in the classroom to help just calm down a little bit more, to help maybe um, changing your mindset about this or that, that so that you can start to shift little stresses in your mind and maybe frame them in a different way to where they don't impact you quite as much. Um, everything from the, the mindfulness, mindfulness strategies and mindfulness practices all the way to, uh, we had a, a, um, an episode with Signal Center CEO talking about for directors, how do you create a culture, uh, a center culture that's based on self-care um, that has the, the employer and, um, and self-care first? And how does that kind of change and impact the work that you do? Um, had an, uh, had an episode like his last week that we recorded within uh, someone from uh, Harvard Medical School about mindful eating, um, which is really interesting. Different ways that we can um, use food, something that we engage with two to three times a day, but often mindlessly, right? Because we're busy or we're doing other things, we're focusing on other things. How do you use food and meal a meal time to help cultivate presence or to bring your awareness back to the present moment? So it was a really interesting conversation as well. Um, so it's been all over the place, um, and it's been a learning curve for sure. But um, we've we we're really excited and thrilled about the guests that we've had on up to this point. I know my personal favorite was um, uh, the chat uh, about building resilience and to be sometimes um, the air codes brave enough to face a little bit of discomfort. Mm. 
and mm-hmm. uh, to build your resilience that way. Um, so yeah, I mean, you guys yeah. have a, and I, I mean, pardon me saying it's just not early educators that would benefit. I think it's, it's, it's quite a, a wide open audience that would derive benefit as well. It's yeah, absolutely a lot of the, the things that we talk about are universal truths to you know it's the they're just good things to take into consideration whether you're in the early childhood education field or not um things about slowing down but yeah that, that conversation with pat stanislowski about cultivating resilience was um she's a she's a tough cookie has been working in child abuse for f- prevention for 45 years um and I mean, she talks about her story in that episode, and it was really, really interesting. And I really respect her transparency and all of that, and how her story has motivated and transformed her work in developing resiliency in, in children and educators. Um, yeah, it was a it was a really interesting conversation. But Alex, um, for our folks interested in learning more about the work done at Signal Centers as well as the podcast, how would they be able to reach out and um, receive that content? Absolutely. So the the hub for Signal Centers, you can visit on our website at signalcenters.org. It's S-I-G-N-A-L-C-E-N-T-E-R-S.org. And then from there, you've got links to all of our different programs. My program, um, the Child Care Wages Tennessee, we do have a separate website. That's tnwages.org. And then another program that we do, Wesley Mays, who you mentioned, my co-host, is um, the marketing specialist for a different program that's also statewide called the Child Care Resource and Referral Network, and that is tnccrr.org. As far as the podcast goes, um, on the the Wages website, there is a link to the the podcast, but our main hub is at leanintu.buzzsprout.com. you can also just Google Lean Into You. I'm, I'm pretty sure by this point it will just pop up. But then we're also available on Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts. So we pr- produce a weekly episode. Um, and so we hope that if your your listeners, your audience do tune in, they derive a lot of benefit and value from it. Thank you so much, Alex. So guys, while you're out listening, go ahead and search for Lean Into You and um, I know Alex would appreciate a rate and a review as well once you've listened to an episode, and so would I. Alex, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. You as well, Marsh. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been This has been great. It's interesting being on this side of the microphone for I once. I know. Isn't it nervous? It's crazy. <laughs> no, but I love it. I love it. It's a whole different perspective. It really is. But I mean... Regardless of whether it's a different perspective, it's still the same great information that gets put out. And I just really value this medium because it's you're consuming your content while you're on the go. You, you're not restricted to any desk or you know device. Well, I take that back. I guess you are. <laughs> you 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 have your earbuds in uh, and your cell phone. But I mean, it's it's just it's just. It's an amazing way to to learn. I agree, and I think people are are really into the just the humanness of it. Like, yes. you are a human. I am a human. We are coming together, having a conversation, and it's raw. It's for the most part un- and unedited. Um, I don't know if you're like me. We actually do a fair amount of editing, <laughs> but but uh, for the most part, it's uh, yeah. It's just I think people are really attracted to the rawness of the medium. I totally agree with you that using these conversations to flesh out um, different ideas and topics and um, is yeah yeah to get people to think in a little bit different way it's great and I've loved it I've loved every minute of doing the lean into you I'm sure uh, you'd probably say the same thing with this project so yeah I think I've on my end I've learned a whole lot more than I I thought possible I mean I thought I came in here feeling a a, knowing a quite a bit but actually I I don't. So yeah, it's a yeah. continuous learning process. And absolutely, Alex, I'm so grateful for your time. And likewise, yeah, likewise. Thank you for the opportunity. No problem, man. I'm, I'm, I would love to talk to you again, and you have a uh, an awesome afternoon and weekend. Thank you so much. You as well. Thank you for your time and listening to today's episode. Uh, For further information and some of the references and resources listed 
pop over to raisingkillen.org where those will be listed um, under today's episode. Furthermore, we would appreciate you giving this podcast a rating and a review. And if you would like to contact us, you can reach us at raisingkillen at gmail.com. Uh, This episode was brought to you by Move Up Physical Therapy. And guys, we look forward to seeing you the next time. And as always, remember, get to the top of your mountain. This is Marsh Naidu signing off.